This presentation is brought to you by the Pharmacy 4B Group 1. So today, we're going to discuss about the antibiotics. As you can see on the screen, the antibiotics are divided according to their mechanism of action. Over here, we have the cell wall synthesis inhibitors, the folic acid metabolism inhibitors, the cytoplasmic membrane structure inhibitors, the protein synthesis inhibitors, which acts specifically on the tRNA. We also have the protein synthesis 30S inhibitors and the protein synthesis 50S inhibitors. We also have DNA-directed RNA polymerase inhibitors, the RNA elongation inhibitors, and lastly, the DNA gyrase inhibitors. But we're going to focus on the cell wall synthesis inhibitors which includes the cycloserine, vancomycin, bacitracine, penicidines, cephalosporines, monobactams, and carbapenems. So for the cell wall synthesis inhibitors, we have the penicillins, cephalosporines, monobactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, carbapenems, glycopeptide antibiotics, bacitracine, zaptomycin, phosphomycin, and cycloserine. Under the cell wall synthesis inhibitors, we have the beta-lactam antibiotics, which includes the penicillins, cephalosporines, carbapenems, and monobactams. All of the drugs in this group contain a four-membered nitrogen-containing beta-lactam ring in their structure. All of the drugs in this group share similar features of chemistry, mechanism of action, pharmacologic, and clinical effects. To start off, we have the penicillins. All penicillins are derived from 6-amino penicillinic acid. For the brief history of penicillin, the discovery of penicillin, one of the world's first antibiotics, marks a true turning point in human history when the doctors finally had a tool that could completely cure their patients of deadly infectious diseases. Penicillin was discovered in London on September of 1928. As the story goes, Dr. Alexander Fleming, the bacteriologist on duty at St. Mary's Hospital, returned from a summer vacation in Scotland to find the messy lab bench and a good deal more. Upon examining some colonies of Staphylococcus aureus, Dr. Fleming noted that the mold called Penicillium notatum had contaminated his petri dishes. After carefully placing the dishes under his microscope, he was amazed to find that the mold prevented the normal growth of the Sapilococci. The Structure of Penicillin all penicillins contain a thiazolidin ring, which is a five-membered nitrogen-saturated ring. Attached to it is a carboxylic acid, which is usually ionized and administered as sodium or potassium salt. It is also thought that the activity is reduced when it is modified into an alcohol or ester. Another part is the sulfur which is usual but not essential. Attached to the thiazolidin ring is the beta-lactam ring. Together with the thiazolidin ring, the beta-lactam ring and the thiazolidin ring are known as the bicyclic system. The bicyclic system confers further strain on beta-lactam ring. It is thought that the greater the strain, the greater the activity, the greater the instability of the molecule to the other factors. The beta-lactam ring carries the amino acyl side chain. Substitution can be made on the R position. Substitution with an electron withdrawing group render the amide oxygen less nucleophilic. A substitution with a bulky group provides steric hindrance to beta-lactamase. And finally, incorporation of a polar group makes it more hydrophilic. 
Another part is the carbonyl group, which is a lone pair electron located on the nitrogen atom not fed to carbonyl group to form stabilized resonance structure, thus more electrophilic for nucleophilic attack. Mechanism of action. Both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria have these beta-lactamase enzymes. These enzymes are responsible for the inactivation of penicillins. As you can see on the screen, gram-negative bacteria have more beta-lactamase enzymes. That's why it is harder to penetrate a gram-negative bacteria than a gram-positive one. All bacteria produce these penicillin-binding proteins, are also known as transpeptidase. These transpeptidase, or PBPs, are responsible for the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layer. This is the peptidoglycan layer. PBPs are usually located in the cytoplasmic membrane. That's why in order to target these PBPs, Penicillins and cephalosporins have to go through the cell wall to target these PBPs. The major difference between a gram-positive and a gram-negative bacteria is that gram-positive bacteria have this thick layer of peptidoglycan, but this is not usually a barrier for drugs to enter. On the other hand, gram-negative bacteria have this additional outer membrane which is a lipid bilayer. That's why hydrophilic molecules like penicillin cannot easily penetrate the cell. They need to use this porin channel, which are pretty channels that let in hydrophilic molecules and possibly also the drugs. Penicillins act by inhibiting bacterial growth through interfering with the transpeptidation reaction of the bacterial cell wall synthesis. The cell wall is a rigid outer layer that completely surrounds the cytoplasmic membrane, maintains cell shape and integrity, and prevents cell lysis from high osmotic pressures. So penicillins, by interfering with the transpeptidation reaction, prevents the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan layer, which gives the cell wall its structural rigidity. Thus, Penicillin renders the bacteria more susceptible to destruction. Resistance to penicillins and other beta-lactams is due to one of four general mechanisms. First is the inactivation of antibiotic by beta-lactamase. Beta-lactamase production is the most common mechanism of resistance. Hundreds of different beta-lactamases have been identified. Some, such as those produced by Staphylococcus aureus, Haemophilus influenzae, and Escherichia coli are relatively narrow in substrate specificity, preferring penicillins to cephalosporins. Second is the modification of target PBPs. Other target PBPs are the basis of penicillin resistant in Staphylococci and of penicillin resistance in pneumococci and enterococci. These resistant organisms produce PBPs that have low affinity for beta-lactam antibiotics and consequently, they are not inhibited except at relatively high, often clinically unachievable drug concentrations. Third is the impaired penetration of drug to target PBP. Resistance due to impaired penetration of antibiotic to target PBPs occur only in gram-negative species because of the impaired outer membrane of their cell wall, which is absent in gram-positive bacteria. Beta-lactam antibiotics cross the outer membrane and enter gram-negative organisms via outer membrane protein channels called porins. Absence of the proper channel or down-regulation of its production can greatly impair drug entry into the cell. Third is the antibiotic efflux. Gram-negative organisms also may produce an efflux pump, which consists of a cytoplasmic and periplasmic protein components that efficiently transport some beta-lactam antibiotics from the periplasm 
back across the cell wall outer membrane. For the pharmacokinetics of penicillins, absorption of orally administered drug differs for different penicillins, depending in part on their acid stability and protein binding. We have available depot forms, for example, benzatine PENG and procaine PENG, which are formulated to delay the absorption, resulting in prolonged blood and tissue concentration. For the distribution, penicillins are widely distributed in body fluids and tissues, with a few exceptions. And since penicillins are polar molecules, they are unable to cross the blood-brain barrier. For the excretion, penicillins are rapidly excreted by the kidneys, with the exception of naphthenine, which is primarily cleared by biliary excretion, and also oxacidin, like cloxacidin and cloxacidin, which are eliminated by both the kidney and biliary excretion. And because of the active tubular secretion, most penicillins have a short half-life. For example, the normal half-life of penicillin G is approximately 30 minutes. Classification of penicillin Penicillins are divided into five groups. First group, we have the natural penicillins, which include the penicillin V and penicillin G. This is the structure of the penicillin G. PEN-G was the first penicillin used when penicillins were first discovered. It is absorbed orally with about two-thirds of the dose being degraded by stomach acids. Penicillin G is very susceptible to beta-lactamases, the enzymes which inactivate the compound by degrading the beta-lactam ring. We also have the penicillin V. This is the oral form of penicillins. It is indicated only in minor infections because of the relatively poor bioavailability, weaker antimicrobial activity, and the need for frequent dosing. We now proceed to the next group. We have the beta-lactamase-resistant penicillins, which include the methicillin, naphthalene, oxacillin, cloxacillin, and dicloxacillin. All of the drugs in this group contain a bulky side chain. This bulky group acts as a protection against the beta-lactamase, thus preventing the degradation of the beta-lactam ring. The third group are the amino penicillins, which have an extended spectrum. This includes the amoxicillin and ampicillin. Both drugs are similar to penicillin G in the activity against gram-positive organisms, but are weaker than the latter. They are also similar to chloramphenicol, in the activity against gram-negative organisms. Amino penicillins are acid-resistant, but are not penicillinase-resistant. The second to the last group are the carboxypenicillins, or also known as anti-pseudomonal penicillins. They also have an extended spectrum, which includes carbenicillin and ticarcillin. It is thought that ticarcillin is more active than carbenicillin against P. aeruginosa and enterobacter species. And last, we have the uridopenicillins or anti pseudomonal penicillins, which have extended spectrum. These include the mesilocinin and piperacillin. As you can see, all groups are active against gram-positive. However, groups 1, 2, and 3 have little to no effect against gram-negative, and only groups 4 and 5 have the activity against gram-negative organisms. Aminopenicillins, carboxypenicillins, and uridopenicillins are usually combined with beta-lactamase inhibitors. Indications of penicillins For natural penicillins, they are used in the treatment of syphilis and they are active against streptococci, meningococci, penicillin-susceptible pneumococci, non-beta-lactamase-producing gram-negative bacteria, clostridium species, and actinomyces. For beta-lactamase-resistant penicillins, they are used in the treatment of S. aureus infections. For amino penicillins, 
Amoxicillin is used in the treatment of urinary tract infection, sinusitis, otitis, and lower respiratory tract infections. For ampicillin, it is used in the treatment of shigellosis and is active against enterococci, listeria monocytogenes, E. coli, salmonella species, and age influenzae. Both ampicillin and amoxicillin are used in the pneumococci infection. On the other hand, carboxypenicillins are used in the treatment of pseudomonal infections, while uridopenicillins are active against gram-negative bacilli such as Klebsiella pneumoniae. Penicillins together with beta-lactamase inhibitors such as clavulanic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam are active against beta-lactamase producing strains of S. aureus. Adverse reactions of penicillins Penicillins usually cause hypersensitivity, which includes skin rushes, fever, eosinophilia, angioedema, serum sickness, and aphylactic shock. It can also cause gastrointestinal upset when orally administered. Nephrotoxicity can also occur, but it's very rare. Superinfections can also occur. Under the metal-lactam antibiotics, we also have the cephalosporins. They are derivatives of 7-aminocephalosporinic acid and are closely related in structure to penicillins. As I have said, cephalosporins are similar to penicillins, but they are more stable to many bacterial beta-lactamases and therefore have a broader spectrum of activity. Brief history of cephalosporins. Cephalosporins compounds were first isolated from culture of Cephalosporium acrimonium in Sardinia in 1948 by the Italian scientist Giuseppe Brozzu. Brozzu noticed that these cultures produced substances that were effective against Salmonella typhi, the cause of typhoid fever. Structure of cephalosporins All cephalosporins consist of a dihydrothiazin ring, which is a six-membered ring. Substitution at the third position is responsible for the chemical and metabolic instability and the decrease in effect on antibacterial activity. Sulfur can be substituted, sulfur can be substituted with oxygen to become oxazepam and a carbon to become carbazepam. Attached to the dihydrothiazin ring is the beta-lactam ring, which is, the, which is required for PBP reactivity and antibacterial activity. The beta-lactam ring carries the acyl side chain. Substitution may influence the antibacterial activity and affect the binding of beta-lactamase. And lastly, the carbonyl group, which is the lone pair electron located on nitrogen atom, not fed to the carbonyl group to form a stabilized resonance structure, thus more electrophilic for a nucleophilic attack. The mechanism of action of cephalosporins. Cephalosporins are bactericidal and have the same mechanism of action as other beta-lactam antibiotics such as penicillins, but they are less susceptible to beta-lactamases. These are the beta-lactamases. Cephalosporins also interfere with the transpeptidation reaction, which disrupts the synthesis of the peptidoglycan layer forming the bacterial cell wall. Classification of cephalosporins Cephalosporins can be classified to different generations according to their antimicrobial activity. Their classifications are as follows. For first generation, we have cefazoline and cephalotin used as parenteral agents, while cefadoxyl, cephalexine, and cefradine are used orally. For second generation, we have cefotetan, cefositin, and cefuroxime used as parenteral agents, while cefachlor, cefcrozil, and cefuroxime acetyl are used as oral agents. For third generation, we have cefotaxime, ceftazidine, ceftizoxime, 
ceftriaxone, and cefepirazone used as parenteral agents, while ceftinir, cefditorin, cefpodoxime prosepil, ceftibutin, and cefixime are used as oral agents. For fourth generation, we have two, cefepime and cefpirone, which are used as parenteral agents. And lastly, the fifth generation, we also have two agents, ceftaroline and ceftobiprol, which are used parenterally. For the indications, first generations are active against Proteus mirabilis, Estrichia coli, and Klebsiella species. While for second generation, they are active against Haemophilus influenzae and Neisseria species. Second generations are also active against the organisms that are treated by the first generation. For the third generation and fourth generation, they are active against Citrobacter, Actinobacter, Enterobacter, Ceratia species, and Pseudomonas. And lastly, for the fifth generation, they are the only agents active against methicillin resistant S. aureus. Adverse reactions of cephalosporins. Cephalosporins can cause hypersensitivity, including anaphylaxis, fever, skin rushes, nephritis, granulocytopenia, and hemolytic anemia. Cephalosporins can also cause GI distress, local irritation after intramuscular injection, and thrombophilobitis after intravenous injection. And lastly, it can cause renal toxicity including interstitial nephritis and tubular necrosis. Other beta-lactam drugs include monobactams. Monobactams are drugs with a monocyclic beta ring. This is the monocyclic beta ring. Their spectrum of activity is limited to aerobic gram-negative rods, including P. aeruginosa. Unlike other beta-lactam drugs, they have no activity against gram-positive bacteria or anaerobes. One example of monobactam is the astreonam, which is the only monobactam available in the USA. It has structural similarities to ceftazidim, and its gram-negative spectrum is similar to that of the third-generation cephalosporins. Astreonam is usually stable against beta-lactamases, and it penetrates well into the cerebrospinal fluid. Astreonam is given intravenously every 8 hours in a dose of 1 to 2 grams, providing peak serum levels of 100 microgram per ml. The half-life is 1 to 2 hours and is greatly prolonged in renal failure. Penicillin allergic patients tolerate astreonam without reaction. Occasional skin rushes and elevations of serum amino transferases occur during administration of astreonam, but major toxicity is uncommon. The mechanism of action of monobactams and carbapenems are just similar to that of the penicillins and cephalosporins, which includes interfering with the transpeptidation reaction, thus preventing the cross-linking of peptidoglycan layers. Other beta-lactam drugs include carbapenems. Carbapenems are structurally related to other beta-lactam antibiotics. These include doripenem, ertapenem, imipenem, and meropenem. Imipenem which has a structure shown in this slide, is the first drug of this class, which has a wide spectrum with good activity against many gram-negative rods, including P. aeruginosa, gram-positive organisms, and anaerobes. It is resistant to most beta-lactamases, but not to carbapenemases or metallo-beta-lactamases. Enterococcus physeum, methicillin-resistant strains of staphylococci, Clostridium difficile, Burkholderia cepasha, and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia are resistant. Imipinem is inactivated by dehydropeptidase in renal tubules, resulting in low urinary concentrations. 
That's why imipinem is usually administered together with an inhibitor of renal dehydropeptidase, which is silastatin. All carbapenems penetrate body tissues and fluids well, including the cerebrospinal fluid. All are cleared renally, and the dose must be reduced in patients with renal insufficiency. The usual dose the usual dosage of imipinem is 0.25 to 0.5 gram given intravenously every 6 to 8 hours, and the half-life is 1 hour. The most common adverse effects of carbapenems, which tend to be more common with imipinem, are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, skin rushes, and reactions at the infusion sites. Metalactamase inhibitors include the clavulanic acid, sulbactam, and tazobactam. These substances resemble the beta-lactam molecules, but they have very weak antibacterial action. However, they are potent inhibitors of many but not all bacterial beta-lactamases, and they can protect hydrolyzable penicillins from inactivation by these enzymes. Beta-lactamases Beta-lactamase inhibitors are available only in fixed combinations with specific penicillins. The antibacterial spectrum of the combination is determined by the companion penicillin and not by the beta-lactamase inhibitor. An inhibitor extends the spectrum of a penicillin provided that the inactivity of the penicillin is due to the destruction by beta-lactamase and that the inhibitor is active against the beta-lactamase that is produced. Aside from the beta-lactam drugs, we also have glycopeptide antibiotics, which include the vancomycin, tacoplanin, delavancin, and dalbavancin. For vancomycin, it is an antibiotic produced by Streptococcus orientalis. It is active only against gram-positive and has a molecular weight of 1,500. It is water-soluble and quite stable. For tacoplanin, it is a glycopeptide antibiotic that is very similar to vancomycin in mechanism of action and antibacterial spectrum. The mechanism of action of this glycopeptide antibiotics will be discussed later. For televancin, televancin is a semi-synthetic lipoglycopeptide derived from vancomycin. Televancin is active against gram-positive bacteria and has an in vitro activity against many strains with reduced susceptibility to vancomycin. Televancin has two mechanisms of action. Like vancomycin, televancin inhibits cell wall synthesis by binding to the D-ALA-D-ALA terminus of peptidoglycan in the growing cell wall. In addition, it also disrupts the bacterial cell membrane and increases membrane permeability. And lastly, dalbavancin is a semi-synthetic lipoglycopeptide derived from tacoplanin. Dalbavancin shares the same action as vancomycin and tacoplanin but has improved activity against most gram-positive bacteria, including methicillin-resistant and vancomycin intermediate SOAUs. Mechanism of action of vancomycin and other glycopeptide antibiotics this represents a gram-positive cell wall. While gram-positive cell wall normally consists of many layers of peptidoglycan sandwiched together, only two layers are shown for simplicity. Also, the periplasm is shown much thicker than it really is in order to better view the steps in peptidoglycan synthesis. So as new monomers are linked to the existing roles of peptidoglycan during cell wall synthesis, Transpeptidase, this is a transpeptidase, form a peptide bridge that cross-links the peptides coming off of each NAM. These links connect each row of sugars with its adjacent rows and each layer of peptidoglycan with each other. This is what gives peptidoglycan its strength. These are the peptide bridge form. Glycopeptides like vancomycin bind to the pentapeptide of the peptidoglycan monomers and block the formation of the peptide crosslinks by transpeptidase enzymes. This is where the vancomycin acts by blocking the formation of peptides.
So as the auto license, this is our the auto license. Continue to break the peptide cross links and new cross links fail to form. The bacterium bursts from osmotic lysis. So this is what happens when vancomycin attacks the cell. Adverse reactions of vancomycin. Most reactions are relatively minor and reversible. This includes plebitis at the site of injection since vancomycin is irritating to the tissue. It can also cause chills and fever. Autotoxicity is rare and nephrotoxicity is uncommon. However, administration with another autotoxic and nephrotoxic drug such as aminoglycoside increases the risk of these toxicities. Vancomycin is also known to cause red band or red neck syndrome, which is characterized by flushing, pruritus, erythematous rush on face and upper torso. Aside from the beta-lactam drugs and glycopeptide antibiotics, we also have other cell wall synthesis inhibitors. First stop, taptomycin. Taptomycin is a novel cyclic lipopeptide fermentation product of Streptomyces roseoporus. Its spectrum of activity is similar to that of the vancomycin, except that it may be active against vancomycin-resistant strains of enterococci and S. aureus. Its mechanism of action is not fully understood, but it is known to bind to the cell membrane by a calcium-dependent insertion of its lipid tail. This results in depolarization of the cell membrane with potassium efflux and rapid cell death. Taptomycin is known to cause myopathy and creatinine and phosphokinase levels should be monitored weekly. Second, we have phosphomycin. Phosphomycin trometamol, a stable salt of phosphomycin, inhibits a very early stage of bacterial cell wall synthesis. It is known to inhibit the cytoplasmic enzyme enol pyruvate transferase by covalently binding to the cysteine residue of the active site and blocking the addition of phosphoenol pyruvate to the UDPN acetylglucosamine. This reaction is the first step in the formation of UDPN acetylmuramic acid, the precursor of N acetylmuramic acid, which found only in the bacterial fall. The drug is transported into the bacterial cell by glycerophosphate or glucose 6-phosphate transport systems. Next, we have the bacitracine. Bacitracin is a cyclic peptide mixture first obtained from the Tracy strain of Bacillus subtilis in 1943. It is active against gram-positive microorganisms. Bacitracin inhibits cell wall formation by interfering with the phosphorylation in cycling of the lipid carrier that transfers peptidoglycan subunits to the growing cell wall. Bacitracin is highly nephrotoxic when administered systemically and it is only used topically. Bacitracine is poorly absorbed, and topical application results in local antibacterial activity without systemic effect. And lastly, we have cycloserine. Cycloserine is an antibiotic produced by Streptomyces orchidaceus. It is water-soluble and very unstable at acid pH. Cycloserine inhibits many gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria but it is used almost exclusively to treat tuberculosis caused by strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis resistant to first-line agents. Cycloserine is a structural analog of D-alanine, and it inhibits the incorporation of D-alanine in peptidoglycan pentapeptide by inhibiting alanine racemase, which converts L-alanine to D-alanine and D-alanyl-D-alanine ligase. Cycloserine causes serious dose-related central nervous system toxicity with headaches, tremors, acute psychosis, and convulsions. That ends our presentation. Thank you for watching!